everybody and welcome back. I am Brooke Osborne and I'm here with Owen Astrakhan. We are going to walk through the curriculum framework right now. So we're going to talk about the, the sort of foundational piece that talks about the course content that's supposed to be covered in a CS Principles course. So um, this computational I'm sorry, this curriculum framework is broken down into two major pieces. There are computational thinking practices and there are big ideas. And we're going to go into, into depth on what both of those look like and how both of those are structured and built out. And, and we're going to give you specific examples of how they interact with one another. So um, we're going to get started by talking about the computational thinking practices. There are six computational thinking practices. We're just going to kind of go through what they are and then give you an idea of why they're useful and how they fit into understanding the curriculum framework, which is going to help you understand what you're doing in class and how the assessment works. So of the six computational thinking practices, they are connecting computing, creating computational artifacts, abstracting, analyzing problems and artifacts, communicating, and collaborating. And so those computational thinking practices are taken, uh, are really there to help students accomplish their goals and the tasks and, and build skills within the context of the CS Principles content. So it, it really gives students an opportunity to engage with the content in a meaningful way. And one of the ways that, that this is done, um, and we're going to talk about this more later on, but they're, they're not just sort of a, a standalone set of practices that exist independent of the big ideas. They're actually put together to create all of the learning objectives for students. So that gives really concrete ways of how students are expected to engage with the content because for every learning objective, it, it exists through a, a cross of a big idea and a specific computational thinking practice. So you can always see a, a specific way that, that the student could interact with that content. And in particular, when we talk in another video about the performance tasks, you'll see how these computational thinking practices, which are helping the students accomplish goals or tasks, help them develop computational artifacts, analyze data, information, and knowledge, and collaborate and communicate, which kind of inform how the performance tasks will be useful assessments in making sure that students have mastered this content. So let's look at a specific example of a computational thinking practice. So the third practice that Owen mentioned before is abstracting. And when you look at the curriculum framework for all of the practices, there are sort of specific examples of how you can demonstrate and how you can use the practices. So here are a few examples from abstracting. You can explain how data, information, knowledge, is that a typo? <laughs> We're missing a comma and we're missing a verb. So I think it's better this way. Explain how data information and, and knowledge, knowledge are, are represented for, for computational, computational use. use. Boom. That's bad. You can explain how abstractions are used in computation or modeling. You can identify abstractions and you can describe modeling in computational contexts. So rather than just listening to us list those to you, I would encourage you to check out the curriculum framework to see the, the actual language. But the reason we, we wanted to read a couple of those off for you is to so you can see sort of the wide range of how these thinking practices are imagined and how we think students might use them in the class. And you can also have sp some specific context for how they're used. Those computational thinking practices, Brooke mentioned they're going to be combined with big ideas to create the learning objectives. You've heard about the big ideas before in a previous video, so we're not going to spend a lot of time going over them in detail, but you need to have an idea on just kind of what those seven big ideas are. Creativity, abstraction, data and information, algorithms, programming, the internet, and global impact. But the main purpose of what we're doing today is to help you it guide you through understanding how to read almost the curriculum framework using the big ideas as the first way of thinking about how you look at it. But now we're going to kind of go into a, a more detailed look at the curriculum framework. Right. So for all of the big ideas, we have a set of sort of a hierarchical set of, uh, of sub ideas or subtopics. So the first, the highest level set there is the essential question. So these are really high level um, sort of overarching things that, that your students should take away and that your lesson should be addressing. So if we look at big idea number four, there are a couple, uh, which is algorithms, there are a couple of essential questions. And I, I'll 
I'll, I'll read a couple of them to you now. So one of the essential questions is how are algorithms implemented and executed on computers and computational devices? So again, very high level. We also have why are some languages better than others when used to implement algorithms? What kinds of problems are easy? What kinds of problems are difficult? And what kinds of problems are impossible to solve algorithmically? And finally, how are algorithms evaluated? So these are very high level questions that are made up by lower level pieces, which in this curriculum framework are called enduring understandings. And for algorithms, there are two enduring understandings. One, algorithms are precise sequences of instructions for processes that can be executed by a computer and are implemented using programming languages. That's one of the enduring understandings. And for algorithms, there are only two. The other one is that algorithms can solve many, but not all, computational problems. So within that first enduring understanding that Owen just mentioned, we have a learning objective. And, and the learning objectives are, are really the outcomes that students need to, need to have in order to demonstrate learning and knowledge. So um, 4.1.1 is the first learning objective in the algorithm's big idea. So that's develop an algorithm for implementation in a program. As Brooke mentioned before, that learning objective comes from this big idea four and computational thinking practice two. And when you look at the curriculum framework, that will be indicated by saying practice two or P2. And we know that this big idea and that practice gives us what students must be able to do. And, and it's, I think, an easy way to remind yourself, okay, how should I get at this learning objective? If you if you put things in context of the, the computational thinking practice, that gives you some grounding for how you th should think about how to address it in your classroom. There are a few more um, essential knowledge statements, which are the, the next category down. So these are specific things that, that are examples of those learning objectives or specific um, outcomes of those, of those learning objectives. So for, um, for the first learning objective in algorithms, we have a couple of essential knowledge statements. A couple being many. <laughs> <laughs> a handful. So uh, the first one is that sequencing, selection, and iteration are the building blocks of algorithms. The second one is sequencing is the application of each step of an algorithm in the order in which the statements are given. So this, we're not going to read all of them, but we want to give you the, an idea of the sort of level of granularity that we're talking about for essential knowledge. So with each of these, these four steps that we've gone through under the big idea, you're, you're seeing increased specificity with each of them. So these are like very specific a, a concrete thing that you can sort of do with your students and that an activity can get out with your students. And probably these are these essential knowledge pieces, which are what students need to know, will be the basis for at least the multiple choice or computer-based assessments that your students are going to have when the AP test becomes uh, an actual AP test in 2016, 2017. When you look at the curriculum framework, you'll see these kind of spread out left to right. We're describing them top to bottom because that hierarchy makes sense. And I think that that conceptual hierarchy and getting more specific makes sense, but it's hard to remember that when you're looking at it left to right. And that's one of the reasons that we're making this video is to help guide you through the process of understanding all these pieces. Right. And then finally, uh, so something that we want to dive into um, that that's another layer of specificity, but is is not specific because of this hierarchical example. It's specific because it's telling you what students don't have to do, don't have to know, and don't have to do. And that's exclusion statements. So if we con continue to think about algorithms and we think about um, the second, the second sort of set of um, of essential knowledge statements, uh, we start to dive into algorithms solving computational problems. So. Uh, you see on the screen right now, we have um, algorithms can solve many, but not all computational problems. And then uh, the learning objective is students must explain the difference between algorithms that run in a reasonable time and those do not run in a reasonable time. And then the exclusion statement that can be applied to that learning objective is listed here as well, and that's this. Any discussion of um, NP complete is beyond the scope of the course in the AP exam. So we don't have to worry about 
anything that's listed in an exclusion statement. That doesn't mean you're not allowed to teach it. It just means the student won't be uh, expected to know that when they sit for the exam and when they, when they work on their performance tasks. And so these exclusion statements help understand what's going on when you look at an essential knowledge piece, since it might not be clear based on the wording, explain the difference between algorithms that run in reasonable time and those that don't. And by looking at the exclusion statement, you can understand, well, okay, I, in my course, if you don't want to, you don't have to talk about NP and NP complete. That won't be on the assessment, the, the test for the course. That is something that you can do if that's something that you want to do in your class, but you don't need to at all. And so it's very helpful in understanding what will be on the test. So this is an example that we're looking at right now of an exclusion statement that is at the learning objective level. But we also want to look at exclusion statements that are at the essential knowledge level. Um, so we're looking now at um, some, some big idea and learning objective and essential knowledge pieces for the internet. And you'll notice here uh, 6.3.1L Public key encryption, which is non-symmetric, is the encryption method that is widely used because of the enhanced security associated with its use. So that's pretty open-ended, and as a result of that, we have this exclusion statement. The, and the exclusion statement is that the mathematical methods used in public key encryption are beyond the scope of the course in the AP exam, which is at least comforting to me when I'm teaching my <laughs> CS principles course that I don't have to talk about discrete log and why a one-way trapdoor function works from a mathematical sense, but I can talk about it from a high-level conceptual sense, which is what's going to hopefully be accessible and interesting to students. So that is sort of a, a walkthrough of how to think about and look at the, the physical document that is the curriculum framework. Um, we hope that this is helpful in understanding how these different pieces work together and how they can um, be used to, to help influence the course you're taking right now and, and the course that you might go on to offer in the future. So thanks so much. Do you who the guy is who's in charge of what happened?